This week on CrossFeed. Religion versus Jesus. Bibles versus spell books. Mega death versus mega life. Santorum campaign versus women presidents. Immigration pro versus con. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, out here in beautiful that in Massachusetts, where we are celebrating the Patriots taking the AFC Championship. So, I haven't been watching football today. So, well, of course not. It's you know you're, you're you're you know still crying tears. Well, that's all right. You know? Now I have somebody to root but, against. <laughs> but after we watched, um, I, after I watched the guy, uh, the, the 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 Baltimore Ravens muff a thirty-two yard field goal at the very end of the game, I think God must be on the Patriots side because I don't know what else could be saying. <laughs> I don't know how that guy could possibly have missed that thing. That the thirty-two yard yard should be a chip shot for those guys, but he blew it completely. Somebody paid him off, I think. <laughs> but otherwise, it was, a, it was a very good game. Oh, oh man, this is not even funny. I was actually visiting somebody this week <laughs> that, that was convinced that I, that that the Packers lost because they got paid off, and <laughs> like the whole thing. I mean, she's convinced. She's convinced. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's times where you're visiting somebody and they're telling you this stuff, and you just sort of go. Okay. <laughs> You're not going to convince them otherwise. You know, <laughs> there know. was a second bullet there. You know, somebody on the grassy you knoll there, a JFK, you know. So <laughs> it's. You know, and then, you know, every, you know, everybody, but maybe perhaps the campfire girls were involved. So you, you just, you know, you just can't win sometimes. <laughs> and if you disagree, it's because you're part of the conspiracy. <laughs> Dale Critchley, conspiratist. Remember yeah. that. I was responsible for JFK. Yeah, yeah. Was Part of me. the Illuminati. Mm-hmm. That's what we. Uh, that's that's what we call our learning community. <laughs> See, I See, told you. I, I'm convinced. All right, those those of you who are familiar with uh, this, is, this is sort of an inside thing. Um, the the uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. We have this transforming churches process, and um, the the. The, probably the biggest problem with it is there's not a lot of information about it. So, like, if you Google it, you Google transforming churches or transforming congregations or something like that, um, you'll see all kinds of misinformation. And there's just not a lot of good, solid explanations out there of, of what it is. And and they were sort of deliberate about it because they decided they're not going to waste a lot of time um, trying to deal with all of the detractors. And you said, we're just going to do this. And, you know, if, if people want to want to find out about it, they can ask or, or if they can, um, you know, check it out, try it out, you know, whatever. But um, we're not going to waste a lot of time dealing with, you know, bloggers and whatever else. And so so there's like all of this, you know, it's 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 like the Illuminati that. You know, there's just there's all this stuff, that, you know, you try to read about it. When we first got involved in it, it was, uh, I, I, I tried to find out a little more information. I started Googling it and I went, huh? And I had all these questions and Jim had already been in it for a while. So I'd ask him the questions. He was like, no, 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 that's not. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, don't believe what you hear. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, we know that. that's because he's part of the conspiracy folks. <laughs> Remember that. You know. Dale Critchley, Manchurian candidate. Well, you know, it's probably because it, people would say might say that I'm religious. Ooh, ooh, ooh! I don't know. I had, well, okay, this is uh, this is something that you know. Everyone's when you get these these um, um, videos to go real viral, you know, like mm-hmm. Rebecca Black's Friday, and. Um, <laughs> Which I've determined is is my most hated thing I've ever seen in my life, and I was wonderfully uh, 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 oblivious to it until I saw that it was the most popular video on YouTube last year. And so I, I went, you what know, is this? I, I'm 
Um, you owe it to yourself to watch it. Oh no no no! I've I've I've. Heard I think it. Gail put her up there. It's part of the conspiracy. The problem, I have I have like all of the the teenage girls, um, in a, a, a run that I deal with, all hate it, and they'll they'll like sing it, but like in a really kind of nasal, like because it gets stuck in their heads, and um and, and so they'll go around singing it. But you can tell they absolutely hate it just by the disgust in their voice as they're singing it. <laughs> so that's what I always hear. Be, be so excited. Anyway, uh, but back to this this video. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of a spoken. It's it's a guy thing. reciting a and, poem, basically. Yeah, and it's you know why I hate religion but love Jesus. Oh, he's a spoken word poet. poet, poet is what he calls himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got his name is. Um, one of these articles has it. Uh, uh, Bethke. Yeah, Jefferson uh, Bethke. Jefferson Bethke. That's or his name. Jeff. And he's a member of um, uh, the Mars Hill Church uh, up in uh, Seattle. And it's an interesting video um, because part of it's right and part of it's an error. And it's just a, 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 and it's basically, you know, his issues with religion versus just knowing who Jesus is. And, um, you know, that he really does not like ritual. He doesn't like, uh, which, uh, 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 things that he sees as rule based religion. Uh, he doesn't like hypocrisy. You know, really? Yeah. If you if you take his entire poem and everywhere you see um, religion, replace it with Phariseeism, you you then it it all works, all right. Um, now, all right. The fact that this guy is a member of Mars Hill Church is no big surprise. And in fact, when I when I watched this video, I went, "Oh, that's Mars Hill." Okay, um, because now Mark Driscoll, I I love his preaching. All right, I I subscribe to his preaching podcast and I really enjoy listening to him. All right, I don't agree with everything he says, but I really enjoy listening to him. He's a very talented preacher, and um, and and, and he's the kind of guy that I think one of the things that that reasons that he's been very successful is that um, he's a he's sort of a, a manly man, and um, and so he appeals to men. All right, and if you get men coming to your church, they will bring their families. Um, and, um, so it, not, not like, it's not like a chauvinist kind of thing. Um, but he's, he's definitely very heavy emphasis on masculinity, uh, the, the sort of masculine aspects of Christianity. And, um, and when he, when Mark Driscoll first started Mars Hill church, um, the, sort of vision for the church was a church for people that don't like church. All right. And so, which being in Seattle, which is like the most unchurched city in the country or something like that. Um, it was, I mean, that was a good plan and, uh, and it's worked out really well for him. All right. Um, but, uh, but what he does is he, he, and this, um, this uh, Jefferson guy is is completely getting this stuff from his pastor. Okay, um, and it, what Mark Driscoll does is he he talks about how religion is bad. All right, and and so he's it, it's the difference between empty ritual and true faith. All right, and and so this. This guy, this poet, sort of takes this concept and just kind of it really just turned the poem into a, or, or, or turned this concept into a poem. All right. So when he talks about true faith, it's great. And he talks about the, you know, sort of it's not about me, it's about Christ. And, you know, and, um, and, and, and there's, there's all that kind of stuff, which is really good. But it's just the problem, I think, is that, They've come up with a new definition for the word religion. 
And, uh, you know, because any, if you look in the dictionary, religion is generally seen as a belief system, not as a system of ritual, that the ritual is seen as, as that which uh, stems from the belief system. What So what Driscoll and this Bethke guy do is they um they they take they sort of bash on um on empty ritual and works righteousness but they call it religion. So once you understand how they're defining religion, the word religion, um then you're okay. Right. Well, I think yeah. It begins with what if I told you Jesus came to abolish religion? That was – that's the first line of his poem, and that's really the point. Now, he defines religion as a man-made attempt to earn God's favor. Religion, therefore, equals self-righteousness, moral preening, and hypocrisy. Religion's all law, no gospel. And he's not the only one I heard define religion that way, by the way. Um, growing up, there's a group uh, – in Kansas City called Kansas City Youth for Christ, and they also defined religion that way. Uh, some people out there who are really old like me might remember Fritz Riddendauer, and he had a, work, a book called How to Be Christian Without Being Religious, and he defined it religion the same way. So that re- definition has been running around Christians for Christianity some time. Um, you know, now, to say that Jesus hates self-righteousness, to say Jesus hates pride and hypocrisy, there's nothing new. But to say he hates religion, that's a little bit different because, you know, they think rules, rituals, dogmas, pastors, priests, institutions. And so we have people who love Oprah and the shack and, you know, spiritual but not religious. Um, and they don't want the strictures that come along with Christianity. And then they, you know, to say, you know, Jesus hates religion. But that's not true. Um, you know, because you also have to love the church. You know, that's a, that's a key thing. There, it's, it's, you know, uh, 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 you can't say God, you know, he, he says that one time, um, uh, if religion was so great, why has it started so many wars? Why does it build huge churches but fails to feed the poor? Tell single moms God doesn't love them if they ever had a divorce. Um, well, you know, uh, uh, his this, the, the first line, why has it started so many wars? Well, because they forgot the purpose of the religion, and the religion began to serve the needs of the state. Um, and there's, there's a you know you can do some good research in Reformation history, you know post Reformation history about that. And you know it sounds hypocritical. Why does it build huge churches but fails to feed the poor? I used to ask that same question. You know, why do we spend all this money in churches? Why do we spend all this money on uh, fancy robes? Why do we spend all this money on um, gold and silver uh, communion wear? You know, and these precious metals and, 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 and jewels and everything. You know, why can't we just use uh, disposable cups and stuff? It would be much cheaper and give that money to the poor or something like that. And then someone pointed out to me that God – directed David in the planning of the temple and that he used gold and cedar and all this very rich, expensive stuff. That there is something said to be giving God our very best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the two don't have to be mutually exclusive. Right. And I I think that's Uh, a lot of these things. It's you get this sort of false dichotomy. Right. right. Um, and this reminds me of, remember we did a story back when Anne Rice, uh, the writer of Interview with a Vampire, uh, became a Christian. And, um, and she talked about how she loves Jesus, but she doesn't like the church. And so, um, so there was this whole question of, can you, um, can you love Jesus? You know, and, um, it, it reminds me of you look at the epistles of John where it says that you can't love the father unless you you can't say you love the father if you don't love the son. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the thing. You can't say that you love the husband if you hate the wife. Right. 
Yeah, well, I, you know, again, the, you know, there's the there's problem with hypocrisy and stuff in the church. I understand where he's coming from in some of the stuff. We see yeah. it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, stuff, you know, because he's talking about, uh, you know, this was me cheer me too, but no one seemed on to me acting like a church kid while addicted to pornography. See, on Sunday I'd go to church, but on Sunday I'd get baited, acting as if I was simply created to have sex and get wasted. I spent my whole life building this facade of neatness, but now I know Jesus, I boast in my weakness. And so here his, you know, okay, here he's seeing himself. Okay, I, I was playing this game. What really irritates me about this poem, however, is the beginning of stands of verse 4. Now, I ain't judging. I'm just saying quit not, quit putting on a fake look. Now, the fact is, he is judging. <laughs> mm-hmm. The whole poem's a judgment on religious people. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't get around it. I mean, it really is. Um, you know, uh, so I, I don't know. You know, I, at the end of this, you know, I mean, here, here's his definition of religion. It's very, at the very, at the, it's, it's the very end of the poem. Um, you see, remember, he was called a glutton and a drunkard by religious men, but the Son of God never supports self righteousness. Not now, not then. My advice to you: start drinking heavily. And that's the definition of religion: mm-hmm. self righteousness. Right. So you're right, Dale, when you said his problem with religion is that it's Phariseeism. Uh, on the other hand, I love it because if grace is water, then the church should be an ocean, not a museum for good people, but a hospital for the broken, which means I don't have to hide my failure. I don't have to hide my sin because it doesn't depend on me. It depends on him. See, when I was God's enemy and certainly not a fan, he looked down and said, I want that man. What I'd really like to do is put the greatness of this man in perspective. So, yeah, beautiful gospel. Uh, yeah. Awesome. You know, he's, he's, you know, it's, it's just kind of frustrating to me, you know, because I'm not judging. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> right, you know? right. I mean, you know, and, in a way, you know who he reminds me of? He reminds me of Keith Green. If you ever heard, you know, Keith Green going on one of his real tirades, a, you know, in holiness, it's too, he sounds like from Keith Green from the 70s. I knew, I said, this sounds so, so familiar. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's who he reminds me of. Yeah, I, you know, and, and actually the, the irony here is that as much as he bashes on, uh, sort of, uh, bastards and, you know, and all that kind of stuff, right? He's actually, what he really needs is some theological education. Because he's, I mean, this guy's got a great gift and he really gets the gospel. All right. I mean, I mean, that's an awesome combination. All right. And he knows how to connect with people. All right. I mean, but he needs either some education or else he needs to take this to a pastor. And I imagine. Mark Driscoll would probably look at this and go, yeah, this is great. Um, so, but that's the difference that we have with Mark Driscoll. Um, but, you know, it, it, just to, if, if you're going to present something and you don't have the theological education to back it up, run it past some people first. Well, you know, I mean, he, you know, I mean, the one guy writes about this and he says, you know, um, this, this person who's writing about this from, um, on Christianity Today, and he says, you know, uh, um, you know, this is, you know, hopeful and youthful idealism. You know, it's something that you expect given his youth and lack of experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and in you fact, know, I mean, uh, the, um, on the Gospel Coalition, which is linked to from that page, I um, uh, got Kevin DeYoung um, actually, he wrote up a sort of a point by point, uh, response to it and then contacted Jeff Bethke and, and, um, and, and they, they were able to communicate and, and Jeff, you know, as he sort of went through and basically said kind of what we've been saying, um, he said, oh, I, I agree with you a hundred percent, you know, so it, it's, that's, yeah, he, he's kind of, 
<sighs> he's kind of shooting his mouth off. His heart's in the right place. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just that sort of uh youthful impetuousness you know um and so i you know kudos to somebody for proclaiming the gospel in a very powerful way um you know and and i really uh you know but i think it's a good lesson in just uh you know before you speak uh you know think about uh Who's going to hear this? What are they going to hear? You know, is, is everything I'm saying right? Um, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. I I want to um, – actually, I'm thinking of, of using this in, in, in confirmation somewhere along the line. I just think this would be a really cool discussion of what is church all about. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, there's just you – know, there or a, a youth Bible class. You could do a lot with this. There, oh, really, yeah. there, there are some stuff there you could just get into with kids and talk about forever. And I think it's somebody who would really, you know, uh, uh, hit their – I mean, hey, 16 million people have seen this thing on, on YouTube. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. It, for somebody who's proclaiming a gospel message and that many people have seen it, you know, I mean – Let's face it, Mark Driscoll right now is going, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? that's, that's the stuff. Hey, speaking of people then who really uh, do the gospel in a different way, um, <clears throat> let's go to Megadeth. All right. Um, <laughs> this, is kind of, this, this story, I don't know if you got it from all your friends in, at Facebook. I got it from about, you know, all these friends of mine at Facebook. All these guys are flipping this up. I got it from Concordia uh, Seminary. Oh, man. Oh, see, I didn't repost it on Facebook because I, I kept getting it from all these people. And I thought, oh, man, I, they just don't need me to repost it one more time. Because uh, originally it was uh, uh, in St. Louis Patch. That's where the story came first. And then uh, St. Louis uh, Today picked it up from them. And then the seminary sent it out from there. But this is really kind of cool. Um, of course, Megadeth was one of the uh, first legendary, uh, first thrash metal bands. Yeah, they kind of um, pioneered it. Right, it kind of not my style of music. Let's just let's just be real honest here, okay? <laughs> it's just you know, no, it's not me. Um, I did ask my daughter; if she ever listened to it, and she said no. She wasn't even too fond, but she did see them one time. She'd go see somebody else in concert, and they opened for them. So she said she, she did see them then. Um, anyway, so uh, one of the members is uh, David Ellison. And uh, he grew up in a uh, Lutheran home, uh, Missouri Senate. Uh, his mother had a Wurlitzer organ sitting in the living room, and that was the first instrument he learned to play <laughs> was his church organ. And um, so he played it there and everything. And uh, then uh, uh, his, fa- his mother, he-, he was confirmed at age 16. I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, his uh, mom sang in the choir. His dad was on the building committee. It was Our Savior's Lutheran Church. And then, uh, you know, when he was probably 19 or 20 years old, he moved to Los Angeles and um, formed a band called Megadeth and just kind of walked away from the church. And, uh, you know, 1985, they released their first album, Killing is My Business and Business is Good. Uh, and I mean, just uh, you know, mean and infectious, the evil prophets rise, dance the dance of the macabre as witches streak the skies, decadent worship of black magic sorcery in the womb of the devil's dungeon, trapped without a plea. That's really positive stuff. Um, well, all right, no, hold on. Be- yes. Before we go any further, <laughs> you know, I, I remember I, uh, um, when I was in college all right um i'm in the car with our with my associate pastor who is sort of our youth what youth was one of the things that he did um and and a couple kids from the youth group who were really into megadeth metallica all that kind of stuff all right and um and so they were talking about at that time the i think it was the latest um album was peace sells but who's buying right and and the associate pastor heard that and he went, peace sells, but who's buying? Huh. I can, 
I, I like that. I, you know, kind of relate to that. And, and the thing is a lot of, if you look at Megadeth's lyrics, it's dark, but at the same time, a lot of it is, um, is written as sort of an indictment of our culture. Now, the problem is that it was a bit hypocritical because at the same time they were getting into drugs and, you know, I mean, all kinds of nasty stuff. So drugs, the, sex, rock and roll, the whole nine yards. They were there. And so here he is, 16, he's confirmed. In the 18, somewhere between 18 and 20, he takes off for Los Angeles, finds this, starts this, this band, hits the big time. By 25, he crashed and burned. And, you know, the, the whole thing caught up to him. And uh, he gets into a 12-step recovery program, either AA or NA or something like that, um, and gets reintroduced to his Christianity, to his Christian faith. He goes to Arizona. Now. Yeah, he goes to Arizona. He gets married and has children, starts church shopping, and he lands at Shepherd of the Desert Lutheran Church, which is an LCMS congregation in Scottsdale. I've actually been there. Have you? Uh, the, yes, I have been. Um, then, and the uh, um, senior pastor there is John Beergard. Uh, John was my successor in vic- at my vicarage church. He was yeah. the vicar after I was, so I know John a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, and then he began attending church there. I start helped worked on the um, I started the contemporary worship service there. Uh, started using lyrics from the Old Testament to to write new songs and praise music and things and other cool stuff. Uh, and now, as of this last September, he started studying at St. Louis uh, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis in what's called the Pacific Ministry Program. So in uh, a couple of years, he will be ordained as a pastor. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if he will wear a collar up there while he's thrashing his 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 bass. He, he still he, the, the band is still touring and everything. I mean, he's still the band is still going. So you know, it's not like he's not gonna. Right. Not yeah. Play. He's he's doing correspondence. You know, it's all internet education. Jim knows all about that because he actually not the specific ministry program, but its predecessor, um, the Delta program. Jim used to teach in that program. So well, actually, I was uh, I didn't teach in it, but I did help start it. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, well, design curriculum, and in the, the SMP program, I teach um, qualifying courses because the end of the program, you have to take. Uh, Sorry, folks, we're closed for two weeks to clean and repair America's favorite family fun park. Sorry. <laughs> As I was saying, I teach these qualifying courses. Uh, you have to take the qualifying exams in Old Testament, New Testament, Christian doctrine. And I teach the courses to help you get qualified for that in New Testament and Christian doctrine. So, Oh, so you're um, teaching now. So you don't, do you have him as a student? No, no, no. Because he, he, he was smart enough to, to not have to have to have me. So he, he moved on. But oh, there was one time I looked at the whole SMP program out of St. Louis and I had almost every guy who was in there. Uh, so, um, but, uh, yeah. So I, I, I'm a real strong believer in, dis- in, in uh, alternative, um, ways of, of getting into the ministry. I'm a very big supporter of those types of things. And I'm a very big, uh, so, so this, I think this is really cool. I think it's cool that this guy came back to his Christian faith. Mm-hmm. I think it's really cool that he uh, um, is now, you know, uh, uh, wants to be a, 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 a pastor in the in the Senate. I think it's also really cool that he's using then this fame to share the gospel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now it's important to note here, uh, since Jim mentioned him, you know, thrashing during worship, um, that he does the sort of praise and worship um, kind of music. I mean, they don't have a heavy metal service. Okay. Um, you know, he's, he, he splits the two and, and that's, that's sort of a question that some people might kind of wonder about is, um, you know, he, he sort of has these two person personas. Um, there's his, his church persona and his rock star persona. 
And while, you know, people know who he is, and so it probably attracts some people to come to church that might not normally come to church, which is really cool, um, as long as eventually they figure out that it's really not about Dave, it's about Jesus, which I'm sure that he's, nice. you know, anxious to let them know. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the fans, unless they're like really hardcore fans that are, you know, following things, they're not going to know that about him. Um, right. So, uh, I, you know... It, Right. Although I'd like to hear what he did for Christmas. He says, for Christmas service, I remix some classics. Not quite in a Megadeth fashion, but in a pretty heavy rock fashion. I'd like to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I know. See, the, you know, and, and that's the thing is, is I, was, I was going, gee, we're starting a, you know, contemporary service. I wonder what stuff he's done. Cause, you know, if he's got a, if he's writing this stuff and it's, you know, it's Missouri Synod stuff, it's not going to, you know, it, it should be good solid stuff. And I, but I looked on, uh, uh, CCLI has that song selects mm-hmm. and, uh, and I looked on there. He's got two songs on there. One of them, uh, is just, it's Jesus Christ is risen today. So it's obviously it's some sort of a, a remix of that, but there's no, all it lists is like the name and the number and stuff like that. There's no information. Uh, the other one is a, a song that he wrote called, um, I'm free or something like that. And it just has lyrics and like a, a 30 second clip audio clip. And, and all you hear is the chorus, which is like, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And I so, might have to uh, send this article to my director of of, of uh, worship arts, um, since he's got a master's in organ performance, and say, "Hey, can we get some of his stuff?" See, now I'm like dying of curiosity. What does his stuff, you know, sound like? Yeah. So um, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I think, I think this is great. It's, it's really cool. See, no, Jim, he was a rock star. Now he wants to be like us. <laughs> We are cooler than rock stars. <laughs> okay, he probably doesn't so, want to be like us. <laughs> I don't know, man. He wants to be a geek. I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> I started off the sermon this morning talking about Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. And uh, a friend of mine, my most good friend, was, I actually was thinking Gollum, but uh, I guess that works. So, you know, never would have thought the way you tied that in, but you did it well. <laughs> Geeks of the world unite. Well, okay, now he was walked away from the church and came back to it and stuff. Um, I wonder what he would have thought had he been in high school and walked in and was given him a spell book. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's a real – that's a region for a segue here, folks, but we, we try. Um, we, we, you know, we don't have teleprompters on the side to, to tell us how to do this. We make it up as we go. Where they can know. you tell that? I think they can fix <laughs> that out. <laughs> Well, this is kind of an interesting church versus state story. So there is the Buncombe uh, County Board of Education in uh, Weaverville, North Carolina. Oh, man. Weaverville, the North Windy Ridge High School. Man, I'll tell you, this stuff all sounds like something from down south, doesn't it? (laughs) Ah, This is North Windy Ridge School. High school in Weaverville, North Carolina. <laughs> Congratulations! You you just offended like every you know viewer and listener that lives in the southern half of the United States. I'm from Kansas City. I spent a lot of time among the hicks and hillbillies in the Ozarks. So, <laughs> okay, I and in Arkansas for that matter. So you know, I may insult them, but I do. I I, I have been there. You know, I got you know, Split P Arkansas or whatever name that place was, um, you know, P Ridge. Uh, so you know, it's, anyway. So in this uh, uh, high school, every year the or uh, middle school in this case, um, the Gideons would put out new give send, bring New Testaments into the office. And they put them in the office, and then there'd be an announcement. Any kids who want to copy the New Testament are free to come to the office and get one. Well, so this little girl, her name is uh, uh, a little boy. Uh, she has a son. Uh, and this, uh, this kid, he doesn't give his name. Um, he brings a Bible home. And his mom, Ginger Stravelli, is a witch. Uh, now, I don't know if she's into Wicca. Uh, it says uh, she practices witchcraft, capital W, a form of paganism, capital P. 
and she was upset. So um, she called, and they said, uh, "Oh well, anybody who you know has a religious book can just drop it off in the office, and we'll put an announcement. If kids want it, they can come get it." We don't, yeah. So she says, "Oh, okay." And so she showed up then with a whole bunch of pagan spell books, and they're like, "Oh, <laughs> you can't leave that here." Ah, uh, and. Uh, so now they have this big issue. What do we do? Do we ban the Bibles? Do we allow the spell books? What do we do? So, and the so jury's still out. Jury's still out. Yeah, they're, they're making the decision. Now, see, <clears throat> I don't know. See, I would have, see, I wouldn't have turned away. I, I would have just looked at it and said, now, you, of course, you realize that you have to provide one. For every kid who wants one. <laughs> I can see them being pretty popular, actually. <laughs> yeah. And you realize we have three, we have 400 kids in the school. So you're going to go out and spend $2,500? I mean, you know, the Gideons do. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> um, are you going to do this every year? They do it every year. You know, I mean, you know, what what are some of the full implications of, of this thing? But she got it and man, managed just to, you know. You know, at the well, same man, time. Her I, name's Ginger Stavelli and her daughter is Sybil Sue. Like, doesn't that sound like, how you doing there, Sybil Sue? <laughs> yeah, but it's all one word. The C yeah, part I, isn't capitalized. I don't care. It still sounds, you know, this, my name's Ginger. This is my daughter, Sybil Sue. <laughs> And then my son John Boy. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we get negative um, reviews on iTunes. <laughs> I'm sorry, it sounds like a bunch of hits. It sounds like people I know. I really know these guys. You know? So anyway. <laughs> isn't it great how he adorns the office? <laughs> So, um, I, I look at this and I think she's got a point, all right? It's really not the school's business to be handing out Bibles, all right? Um, let the Gideon stand on the corner, right, you know, right off the school property and, and hand out Bibles. That's the way they do it in most places. Um, you know, they stand across the street or something and hand them out to anybody that wants them. Was that your gift, putting up with that guy? Looks like the Giants and the San 49ers can go ahead into overtime here. Great. 17, 17, 32 seconds left in the game. Okay. Um, wow. All right. Um, I, yeah, so, uh, I don't know. I, I think that this is a church-state issue that public schools shouldn't be handing out Bibles. Um. You know, it, it does come across as a promotion. And especially if they're not going to, I mean, and, and that's the problem is you open up a can of worms when you do that. Right. Um, you know, and besides that, there's stuff, I mean, they're New Testament, so they're not as bad, but I mean, there's stuff in the Old Testament that you don't want just any kid reading. <laughs> well, I think if they, if they are, um, Gideon, they probably just be handing out New Testaments. Right. Uh, now, <laughs> I love this. Uh, one uh, guy lives down there, Bobby Honeycutt. Man, these names are just all got. Sybil Sue's my husband. This is my friend Bobby. <laughs> and this is our brother Bubba. Um, he says, Our country was founded on Judean Christian principles, not Wiccan principles. Well, yes. It well, really deist principles. But, you know, it's, again, you know, it's it's not. You know, she says many Christians have stood up and said that they agree with me uh, because as much as they may like the Bible, they don't want Jehovah's Witnesses coming in with Watchtower magazines or Catholics coming and having them pray the ro rosary. Well, the Catholics wouldn't come and have them pray the rosary. They might put rosaries out in the office for them to pick up mm -hmm. and, um, you know, prayer books to Mary. Right. And she's right. What's 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 to stop the, the Jehovah's Witnesses from putting a pile of Watchtowers on there? But, you know. I would have, if I'd been the principal, I said, okay, ma'am, sure, no problem. You want, you want to go get 300 copies of this? 
which you have four books there. I mean, we, we're getting 300 copies of each one because, you know, we, we can't tell any kid it's not here. No, no, I, I just want to, you know, I just wonder what she would have done if, I, if the principal said that. You know, you, you need to, you know, you need to provide a copy for every kid to come here and get one if they want one. Because these probably these are probably going to be really popular. Oh, and by the way, we tell the parents the Gideons give the Bibles, so we're going to have to tell them tell the parents that you give spell books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we we don't accept anonymous donations. I mean, I would have. Why does said here? Here, here's the condition under which we accept them. You have to meet the same conditions. Yeah, she might be getting a visit from Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Civil Sue, I think you need to stay home now. <laughs> anyway, so we, we better leave that. But that was an, that was an interesting story. But no, seriously, on a, on a much serious note, I do believe it's right. I do believe that, you know, again, um, the Gideons need to stay and be across the street or they need to be out on the, you know, the sidewalk as the kids come in. You know, they can have a sign there, Free New Testament. Mm-hmm. You know, and she wants to, she can stand out there and say, Free spell books, you know, and the kid bring it home, then hey, she gets in trouble for it. That's, but. Much as possible, school should stay out of it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, let's take our jump into uh, politics for the week. Uh, Speaking of Hicks. What? <laughs> to Rick Santorum? Yeah. Speaking of Rick's. Um, Hicks. This is um, well, it's that kind of older story because it really takes place, really took place during the Iowa caucuses, although the. Um, the date was uh, January uh, 18, uh, January 18th on the story. Um, but it seems that there was a uh, uh, member of Rick Santorum's uh, staff when he was in Iowa, a guy by the name of Jamie Johnson. Oh, man. Sybil Sue, this is my friend Jamie. <laughs> Sorry, what's a guy doing name going around with a name like Jamie? Uh, sounds like a girl's name. Anyway. James? Yeah, yes, yes. James would be appropriate. <laughs> Sir, even better. But anyway, um, <clears throat> he sent, and he sent this email over the summer. This is funny. Is it God's highest desire, that is his biblically expressed will, to have a woman rule the institutions of the family, the church, and the state? Old woman, man! And I guess his answer to that was, no. And uh, then uh, he kind of really kind of, you know, aimed a little bit at Michelle Bachman and uh, uh, his uh, her uh, faith outreach coordinator said uh, that the email was proof that Centorum had engaged in a sexist strategy to sabotage Bachman. And he demanded an apology from Centorum and called for Johnson's firing. Which is. Just an excuse to <laughs> to complain, right? And uh, Santorum did not give an apology, and Johnson, by the way, is unapologetic. He says his ideas were based in classical Christian doctrine and the reflections of twenty-five years of formal theological study. Really? Where, like Bob Jones University or something? Oral I Roberts? don't know. <laughs> Because I can't find anything in the scripture that says women cannot be um, the head of a country. He would have um, had a problem with Deborah being a judge, huh? Well, actually, if you look in the 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 um, uh, the, the the, the uh, uh, comments, that comes up like two or three times. Uh, Deborah being a judge. I mean, there was one. On the, granted, Israel only had one queen, um, and you know, but she was the daughter of Ahaz and evil. So, um, you know, what, you know, could there have been a godly queen? I mean, um, there weren't exactly a lot of godly kings. <laughs> yeah, there weren't a whole lot of godly kings anyway, <laughs> let alone the queen, the one queen. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't know what his issue is. I mean, Dale and I are, are members of a church body that does not ordain women. So we do not believe women should be ordained. But outside of that, and outside of the church, I certainly don't believe God has made any rules as far as the state goes. No, no. I, I, believe, I, I also been, believe that women should not be fathers. You know, I, I have no problem with 
a black president, I'd have no problem with a female president. I have no problem with a black female president, or that goes. Heck, you know, I'll, I'll take shiny. a, I'll, I'll take a Smurf as long as they're born in this country, and you know. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, there's, you know, would I vote Michelle for Michelle Bachman? No. But not because of her chromosomes. Right. You know, just because I don't think she that. I, I, it was a bit of a nutcase, you know. I, 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 I'm, I'm picturing, you know, like, but Rick Santorum, he has Y chromosomes. <laughs> <laughs> to which Michelle Bachman looks and says, oh, that's why you get paid more than I do. Okay, now I understand it. Um, but, uh, right, I mean... <sighs> Rick Santorum, now with more Y chromosomes. I like that. Um, but I just think this is silliness. Uh, I don't think the guy, I don't think Santorum needs to make an apology. I don't think he needs to fire this guy. I mean, but this is the type of guy you'd have that question if you, you know, want him to go too high on your staff because if he goes and makes this real public, everybody's going to look at him like, what kind of idiot are you? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not so much offensive, but <laughs> sort of like, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> like, oh, what is this, 1950? <laughs> right, you know. Uh, uh, that face you make, look I so old to your eyes. So. It, it, it's, it's, you know, I, mean, I love this. It's this. The, the recent spat brings the issue of sexism in conservative politics to the fore again. When Bachman ended her campaign, political observers wondered whether conservative perceptions of women and Bachman's own alignment with the Christian right and disavowal of feminism had been her undoing. You know, in the the final weeks of her campaign, Bachman's aides began to complain sexism was a problem in Iowa's religious conservative community. Come on. I don't believe that for a second. I honestly don't. I mean, probably, you know. <sighs> Folks, we're sorry if this is like the, the most disjointed episode ever, as Dale just called it. Uh, we're having problems with Skype and it keeps stopping on us for just random reasons. It just feels like it. Uh, but anyway, okay. You know, Dale knows Iowa, and, and I'm from Kansas City, so I I know Iowa a little bit. The percentage of rural versus urban, almost the same as any other state. Off lot they like it, you know, they say, it's too rural. Well, it's, all, it's pretty much the same, except for maybe New York City. Uh, you want to know too rural versus too urban? I am too rural versus urban? Uh, check out New Hampshire. <laughs> I mean... Wow, what they call a city, New Hampshire, would be called a suburb of most towns. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so let me, let me just throw that out, out at you. A lot of the people in Iowa are college educated, even the farmers, mm-hmm. because you don't become a farmer unless you know animal husbandry and stuff. And you must have to have a, a, a degree in that in order to be a successful farmer. So these people are not a bunch of – this is not Sybil Sue and Bobby, okay? <laughs> These people are not a bunch of rednecks who are going to have a problem with – they, they, they had women professors. They have women uh, um, college presidents. They had women uh, 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 who are successful in their business. Wives are often partners in the business. Wives often work so that the farm exists. You know, I've known more than one farmer's wife who told me, I do this so my husband can keep his hobby. Yeah, well, you know, in Iowa, the saying, you know, what would you do if you, um, if you won the lottery? Keep farming till it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, you know, I mean, seriously. So I don't think they they have a problem. Why did Michelle Bachman lose Iowa? Because she was incoherent. She was never clear. She had a horribly run campaign. And she's There's a lot of. Re- and she's but, really extreme to the right, too, in a know, time where people are moving more and more to the center. But I don't even know what I, I would, I, I'm, you know, that I don't even make a judgment on because I, you know, I mean, how do you explain Newt uh, anyway? But, of course, he did well in South Carolina, which is an extremely conservative state. It'd be interesting what would happen if the first primary is held in South Carolina. 
which is, you know, notoriously very, very conservative, one of the most conservative states in the country, easily. Um, so, uh, but uh, no, I don't think that had anything to do with it. But it's still kind of a weird statement. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's end then. <laughs> oh, well, maybe the Iowans would at least let uh, Michelle Bachman immigrate there, even though she is from Minnesota. Mm-hmm. You know. And, you know, Iowa people say, ask the difference, what's the difference between a Minnesota female and a cow? Not much. Anyway, so uh, I, I, I used to know Iowa. And when you're part of Iowa, do they tell Minnesota jokes? No. No? Oh, oh man. Yeah, you get a little north. They, 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 those two states, they, they, they really consult each other all the time. Uh, but down in Alabama, of course, there's this immigration law. And now Tennessee's having one. And it's interesting to see these two Christian groups uh, debating and arguing on the base of the Bible in favor and against the, all the issues of um, immigration. And Dale sent me the site, uh, Christians for Comprehensive Immigration Reform. So I'm going to let him take the, the lead on this whole discussion. Okay. Um, this is something that I've, I've kind of struggled with. Uh, I, I really don't think that the Bible speaks very clearly on it. Um, or, or maybe the Bible speaks very clearly on both sides of the issue, um, which is how these groups are able to do so. Um, I, I used to be pretty um, hardcore, you know, need to, we have laws in this land and expect people to follow the laws. And, uh, you know, they're, if, if people don't go through the, you know, process uh, the way they're supposed to, then, uh, well, they just they shouldn't come into this country, all right. On the other hand, uh, boy, if you live in Mexico and you're one of the disadvantaged people that is being stepped on um, by all kinds of of things going on, um, you're, it's pretty hard for you to even go through those channels. It is pretty much impossible. And um, you know, as Christians. We are to be compassionate for those who are not able to, um, you know, to speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves and, and things like that. And um, so it, it sort of it, it puts us at a struggle um, with this whole situation um, because you say what you want about America and, and yeah, OK, so we're in a recession. What does that mean? That means that we're like almost as bad off as, you know, most countries in the world. <clears throat> okay. And um so when you've got these people that are absolutely destitute, and the thing is I know people that um you know their their families uh sneaked across the border and they got jobs and they contributed to to society and uh even a lot of illegal immigrants pay their taxes. I'm not sure how. Um Oh, the, uh, 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 <laughs> you can get a um, special social security number from the um, SF for for payment of your taxes. You uh, you know it's it's yeah it's it's really possible. It's 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 kind of interesting. Uh, of course, now in Massachusetts we have Aunt Zaituni, but we won't go down. The, and, and Uncle Omar, um, you know the the uh, um, Obama's uh, relatives, but uh, they're kind of special cases. Uh, but we have a member of our church. Well, she's not, yeah, she's a member. She actually is a member. Uh, who, um, overstayed her tourist visa. Uh, she is from a country where she would be, um, uh, attacked, uh, and uh, hurt and persecuted for her Christian faith. And came over on a tourist visa and just stayed here. And uh, now her, uh, comes Sunday. Now, come February 2nd, she has a, uh, um, asylum interview, uh, with immigration. But, you know, for the past several months since she applied for asylum, she's, I'm not even sure she had, you know, if she wrote the letter applying for asylum before her tourist visa expired. Uh, but she technically is here illegally right now. She can't get a social security card. She can't get a green card. She did have a job, and I was 
appalled at the way she was treated. She's a very highly educated woman. I mean, she has been educated in uh, through all kinds of stuff that you and I, you know, I mean, in, in <laughs> went to school in Italy, uh, uh, has, uh, I think, a master's degree, uh, and just a very, very well-educated woman. And uh, she was working for a place, and they would just conveniently – first off, she was willing to pay for what she should be doing, and then they would just forget to pay her. Yeah, because what are you going to do, right? Right. You know, you can't report it, you can't complain, you know, mm-hmm. or they can turn you in. So, and that's one of the big problems with um, illegal immigrants is that um, they're treated horribly, you know, um, and they're, you, you basically you're, live your life being blackmailed. Um, but it's, you know, when, when living your life being blackmailed by your employer and, and, you know, being a fugitive and all that kind of stuff, it's still better. That shows that we as Christians need to sort of, we need to do something. Right. Well, you know, what, there's always a good question. What is there? What can we do? I mean, uh, we can't do a whole lot to really help some of the situations here. You know, I mean, I, I can't go to this nation and make them unpersecute. We can't go to Mexico and improve the economic conditions there. And the drug lords and all that other yeah. stuff, yeah. yeah. At the same time, on the flip side of this equation, I mean, there is the issue of, okay, so what can we do here in America? You know, aren't we... Yeah, what do we do in America? Uh, so, um, this one lawyer down in... Uh, uh, and, and this 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 situation down in Alabama um, wrote an amicus brief and says a decision sustaining the Obama administration's claims, basically allowing illegal immigrants to come in, will uh, and in this case not allowing Alabama to, to to enforce this law, will effectively leave the states powerless over unchecked illegal immigration and the associated social and economic costs that their citizens must bear. You know. See, remember basically what, what's going on in this, this law is that it says, look, here's the law of the land. The Obama administration says it's not going to enforce that law. Therefore, we're going to pass the exact same law on a state level, and we're going to enforce it because the federal government won't. Mm-hmm. And they're saying, well, the state doesn't have the right to do this. Uh, what else do we have the right to do? Somebody's got to do it. And, um, you know, it, by the way, and of course, it started in Arizona. Um, and the uh, uh, governor of Arizona, Jan Brewer, who signed the license, happens to be a member of the LCMS. Hmm. Yeah, so it's you know, I mean, up here in Massachusetts, okay, we joke about Aunt Zaituni and Uncle Omar. Um, you know, uh, uh, who of course you know got drunk and got into a DUI, so accident. So you know. Uh, uh, what happened? Somebody died, and he'd been here illegally. Uh, but you know, it's harder as you get further south, and Texas, and California, and you know, Arizona, and New Mexico, um, and you know, this illegal immigration is just you know just floods the market, and you have to then not only uh, um, you know you you know dealing about exploitation, but you know, how are you going to pay for all the schools? Uh, how are you going to pay for all the health care? Uh, here in Massachusetts, we have uh, you know what's jokingly called Romney Care, and uh, which has been a big strain on the budget. Well, they were saving money by not covering legal immigrants under Romney Care. Well, guess what? The Supreme Judicial Court said, they're here legally. You have to cover them. So it just blew a $150 million hole in the Massachusetts budget. Hmm. Yeah. So what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with this stuff? You know, it's, it's an area where I don't think the Bible says one way or another. I think it's all more sanctified common sense. And I think it's a real problem when people try to say, here is the Christian answer to it. 
Right. You know, I don't think there is a Christian answer. No, I mean, you know, there's just, the, the, there's no clear, this is how you handle this. Because, all right, because what you're dealing with is, on the one hand, um, you know, the Bible talks about the uh, hospitality, right? Um, caring for the strangers among you and stuff. Well, immigration wasn't really an issue back then. Um, not not the way it is now. I mean, it was <laughs> back then. It was like immigration. No, we just go in and like conquer another country. It was, you know, <laughs> um, or you conquer another. Country. Although we do have the case of um, Ruth's family, who immigrates from Bethlehem to Moab. Yeah, and lives there. And God does talk about taking care of the stranger among you and the resident alien. Mm-hmm. Right. But then, on the other hand, if they're if it's illegal that they're in the country. You know, that wasn't the case there, and we are supposed to respect the laws of the land, right? And, I mean, you know, there's the point is there's really good arguments on both sides, <laughs> right? And so I, I can't talk to either side and say you're wrong. Right. Well, I, you know, it's – and I think it's – you know, it's, it's – it's, you know, one thing if you're dealing with one, two, or three, or four, you know, it's another thing when you're dealing with thousands, Mm-hmm. And that's that's the problem, you know. What what point does it, you know, is it stretching the resources to the point we can't deal with it anymore? Uh, right. And yeah, you can point to the Bible either way. You really can to make make, make the argument. So, uh, but one guy says at the same time says even while we're arguing this, you know, at the same time we always we do have to encourage the people to follow the law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do have to. Uh, uh, you know, talk to the people and say, "Hey, look, um, you know, it's we do have the stuff." So there's, <laughs> I actually, you know, I sent you this site, and I'd have to double check it. But I'm pretty sure this is the one. Um, this uh, Christian for Contra- Christians for Comprehensive Immigration Reform, uh, faithinimmigration.org. dot um, org. You know, there's there's groups like this out there that that are trying to find a balance, um, where yes, we need to respect the laws of land, but when that requires us to turn away somebody in need, you know, then th- that puts us in a real dilemma, and so we need to work for reforming the system, mm-hmm. um, so that we can find a way to allow people that cannot go through the proper channels to come and so that we can help them without, um, you know, destroying our own country. Because then, right. you know, we, like, well, welcome to America. Um, you're pretty soon going to want to be escaping to somewhere else, you know. All right. Well, I like this one thing. Um, Nashville-based clergy for tolerance. They hope to prevent them to see. Oh, they said immigration laws have to mix justice with compassion. Well, that's a nice bromide. I think everybody agrees with that. Yeah. Um, you know. And then there's the Reverend Randy Hoover Dempsey, pastor of All Saints Episcopal Church in Smyrna, Tennessee. And he's got about 200 Burmese immigrants in his church. Uh, he says, the whole heart of the gospel is in Matthew 25, for Jesus said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. No, that is not the heart of the gospel. <laughs> no, that's the law, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's the law. That is not the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is Christ's death and resurrection. Mm-hmm. You know, so everyone's, you know. But of course, uh, because he did that, <laughs> you know, we were the we were the stranger and he welcomed right. us. Uh, one guy, Reverend Jim Bachman of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Nashville says he hasn't taken a stance in immigration reform. But if a member of his church was in the country illegally, the church would encourage him to obtain legal status. The doors of the church are open to everyone, but we want people to obey the law. Well, okay, that's kind of... Oh, behave. Yeah. So, you know... I, I, I think it just points out how difficult of an issue this really is. So... Yep. So, you know, I mean... But a lot of this, I hate to say it, they're, they're kind of pious bromides. They really are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, so it gets to be a little bit frustrating uh, reading some of the stuff. Um, you know, and and you you just kind of like, you know, 
we can say a lot of nice things. But yeah, I, you know, but you're dealing with people. And I think it's sometimes hard. How do you deal with people in a very, in a good way? Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought you froze oh. up there again. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No. Um, so, but, you know, at this point, this being our last story, right? Um, yep. It's been a weird episode. Um, so, you know. It's it, you and me, man. It's always a weird episode. Well, yeah, no, I'm talking about it. It's going to be a pain to edit. Um, but uh, the, you know, we'd really like your feedback. Um, if you're, you know, you send us an email, uh, podcast at crossbeatnews.com. Uh, leave a comment on YouTube or any of the other places where you're watching this, uh, let us know what you think. Um, you know, you got any insights, got any, uh, got a fix, you know, I, I would say don't complain unless you got a better idea. And, uh, so that's one of the reasons you won't hear me complaining much, uh, about the whole immigration issue. I don't have a better idea. And I don't uh, either. So, but if somebody does, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's hear your insights into that or any of the stories that we talked about tonight. Um, yep. So, um, we do yeah, and so just to 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 uh, 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 let you know, Dale, uh, the uh, looks like we're going to have a repeat of uh, the Super Bowl from 2000. Well, actually, it'd be February of 2008, three years ago. Looks like it's going to be the Giants and the Patriots again. Mm. Go Giants! So. <laughs> <clears throat> Yes. Yes. So, but you know what? It's not going to be any fun, this game. They don't have Plaxico Burris anymore. I liked Plaxico. I loved his name. Hi, this score was brought to you by Plaxico. It sounds like a company name, man, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I, I want to meet his parents. How'd you go up with the name Plaxico, you know? It sounds like it, you know? And I keep waiting for the possible side effects include, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you have hair loss? Take Plaxico. <laughs> or, you know, these shoes are made by Plaxico. I mean, it just, you know. I, I feel know. like an oil company, you know? Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so take care, everybody. God bless, and we will see you again next week. Good night, everybody. God bless. Mm-hmm.